What you know about layer one D5, greatest in the world, and they finally about to see why. What you know about XRD, I'm smart money, I ain't never on a decline. What you know about NFTs, it's not just Ace, when well, you finally gonna realize. You need scalability, need more utility, then you better call on these guys. I'm going radical, I'm going radis, I'm going radical, I'm going radis. I just be D5, never on a decline, building the future, I feel like a savage. Hello and welcome. I am Piers Ridiard, CEO of RDX Works, a core developer of the decentralized finance protocol Radix, a public ledger entirely focused on bringing DeFi into the mainstream. This is our podcast, The DeFi Download, where a show we're about decentralized finance and all things crypto, where we dive into the details of the projects, assets, and services that are powering the DeFi revolution. Today, I'm joined by Lasha and Tadze, co-founder of Rarify Labs. Rarify Labs is the service provider creating the Rarimo protocol. Rarimo is creating interoperability for identity and decentralized social in Web3 and crypto. Lasha, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Pierce, for having me. So let's start with, I think, identity is a growing topic within Web3 and DeFi. Why do you think that identity is becoming such an important thing that the crypto industry is caring about more now? I think that um, identity in a broader sense has quite, quite like huge meaning within the digital space. So when we talk about the mostly like financial type of applications, we talk about like standardized regulatory framework around KYCs, but zooming out, we're going to see that like identity has a broader sense when, which is kind of our social reputational presence that happens digitally, not only in web three, but overall in the digital internet space. And uh, the excitement that I have personally is that uh, I'm feeling that like time by time, uh, this aspect becomes uh, very valuable within the ecosystems. And this identity components are used for defining the different value propositions to the users it is assisting into like segmenting the uh, users and the community uh, early communities or the growing communities and it just like allows a more efficient interaction between the dApps between like the decentralized entities and the end user customers um and uh, yeah, I think like without it, it's like a missing holy grail, if you ask me, within this entire space. And we're right at the beginning of defining it and building out as a completely new social layer on top of the blockchains. So you're saying identity interoperability is a missing holy grail within the within the crypto space. I think not only the interoperability, but itself like defining what this identity components are, how it is could be used for capturing like social interactions, purely social interactions, right, within the decentralized space, right. or moving forward, how we could capture like how it could be used within the metaverse, right, or this in new, completely new environment where we're gonna have like mix of like artificial reality and the physical world and uh, overall and plus of course the very traditional understanding of identity that is under the regulatory framework and kyc yeah and i think i think and, you're 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 splitting out something that those people who have spent a long time in identity get very familiar with but those people who don't um is not in, immediately obvious like i don't i am not one identity I am many identities. And when you think we well, don't really realize it, but your Twitter handle is an identity and your Reddit username yeah. is an identity yeah. and your, and your Facebook, you, you know, uh, followers is, is an yeah. identity these are all different identities that i possess that but they are not actually me they are representations of me in different forums and yeah. what what the i think blockchain web3 crypto has this really interesting ability to do is separate this concept of representations of me online and the platforms in which i interact so now i can go okay well 
I'm, I, you know, I started off and I built a big reputation in Twitter, but there's no way of showing I have a big reputation in Twitter, in Facebook or Discord or threads. But with blockchain and Web3 identity, I have this ability to start bringing those identities with me. Yeah. And I have this ability to then go, oh, I, now I have this portfolio of identities. Like I have a portfolio of assets, I have this portfolio of identities. These identities allow me, give me different reputation, give me different weight, give me different visibility within communities. Um, and, and I think, is that what you, when you say the, the holy grail, are you talking about the holy grail of yeah, portable so, identities? Yeah, definitely. And one concept that is key there is the ownership and the ability to manage those components of your identity freely across the ecosystems. And this is the moment where it's not about like you owning the pieces, but being able to interchangeably use across different environments and being able to define what, what aspect of your identity you want to reveal for this or that interaction, whether it's like with the different users or the customers or the devs or whatever mm, digital experience. And that's, I guess, this is the moment where the interoperability aspect comes in. And uh, when we talk about the portability and the ability to freely use across the ecosystems, this is the interoperability aspect. Got it. Okay, well, uh, before we jump into that, I think it'd be really interesting to sort of understand a little bit more about your background and what, what have you done in identity so far? Like what makes you so interested in identity today? My journey, and actually most of the team members that are to this day, we're working together. We started this entire journey in 2014 okay. within the blockchain space, but mm, we were like earlier than you can imagine. So we've been talking about the identity, which is like just getting started. And we can say like, oh, how early it is, but the background story that we have was that in 2014, I was working with the Ukrainian government on the digitalization reform that touched the point of like the, how, how the government issued identity or like the digital signatures could work with it and how do the registry should be work. And then talking about like this and thinking about like how could this new paradigm of government issued digital identity be interoperable within the EU? And uh, back then there was quite an interesting in, in incentives such was like and breakthroughs I would say like the Estonian e residency. Mm. And I was I was like one of the first to get in line and get this uh, digital. Like it was a physical card that has. A, digital signature imprinted within it. And I was like, oh, how can you interact with the Estonian government from long distance, completely online? So this was like all the aspects that got us excited back then. And we saw the challenges within the space. But I think like we were at, not a bit, we were like mega early in terms of like um, all these things because when we decided back then to use blockchain with government reforms and digitalization just to give you an image we're talking about the era when there are no no i mean smart contracts exist on a white paper mm. of ethereum other than that like very few stacks that we could use or implement and but we were like naive and i, I guess like dreamers that we could make this work. And we were, I mean, it was a successful experience from that perspective that we did manage to pull out the early pilots. Of course, we used the, the tech stack that was back then available. It was Stellar. So we, we had to like fork Stellar and reuse the parts of it. And what's most notable and I think like unique from an experience perspective was that so we, we hit the wall in terms of like, how do you define the blockchains, decentralized systems from a legal perspective? So what is the legal tender within the decentralized system? So how could a government or an entity like that authorize or use a completely decentralized network as, I don't know, even from a registry perspective? And mm -hmm. what challenges does it create with the framework? So these were like all big questions back then, but it, it it, it took like multiple iterations. And of course, this time 
both, I guess, the blockchains to mature and provide the enough gravity points and network effects and technology stacks to be now used uh, as a foundation for this decentralized identity and socials to be built upon. And on the other hand, like COVID and different factors, I think made governments, corporations, companies, people more open in terms of allowing the experiments to run within this long distant interaction. And that's, I think, that that's what gives us the kind of signaling within the space that, yeah, we have a certain point of maturity that those things could now really take off. I think it's certainly true that the, um, you know, COVID uh, has helped accelerate the concept of digital digitalization being critical. I'm seeing like sort of um, paper, paper heavy jurisdictions allowing e-signatures and um, paper heavy jurisdictions allowing you to have a, a digital identity check for KYC AML rather than having to have a physical in-person meeting because a lot of these, a lot of these, um, uh rules and regulations were that have been in place for a very long time were not were just not possible to enforce during that covid period and they were like well business can't come to a standstill but how does that relate to the other end of the scale like crypto and web3 is obviously born digital first there is no there is no there were, there was no barriers to get over in terms of making making people be able to sign things with a metamask account or you know be able to interact with a smart contract so what is what is what has changed in the identity world that now means that identity is more easily portable or creatable on ledger and what how's that going to apply to the crypto ecosystem we see today and the businesses that people are trying to create in the crypto ecosystem i th i think that we need to break down uh the different aspects and like expectations within the crypto or like in a regular consumer wise one thing uh in a broader sense like with uh, how blockchains could assist into building up the new standards or like uh, service and infrastructure within the identity service and the, like the uh, the internet that everyone uses. There's like one aspect of things where we have um, like self sovereign identity standard DID and like different incentives that 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 have emerged and have been born out completely non-related to blockchains but with blockchains their power to become a widely used standard or uh, like extend and reach uh, and uh, have this kind of like global presence from day one this is an interesting aspect of collaboration there and then you have very native web3 type of identity and interaction building that is, I think, for now, exclusive and super um, interesting, but from a Web3 space. So you don't have the kind of new, like the new user experiences so far, but the, uh, but the community that, it, that has been contributing within the Web3 space, I think they're opening up this new dim dimension of their reputations, the social identity, interoperability one, from one application to another. It's going to take even more time for this interoperability or portability uh, to be like fused or reused in so-called like Web2, I think. And uh, yeah, I, I don't have like this positive expectations because th there are not only technical challenges, but I see a lot of like business type of challenge uh, and from a customer and even like customer experience perspective. Uh, but yeah, to go back, like both verticals, how do we allow blockchains to be used infrastructure within the identity solutions uh, in more like a traditional sense and the build up? These are like two dimensions that uh, are pretty promising and we're excited to support. So we've now got the framing of, of the space. Could you talk a little bit about what, Raramo is actually doing? Sure, Raramo, mm, Raramo 
is an interoperability protocol. So mm. why, why, when we looked at this space and when we look at the kind of this identity building blocks, you're going to see that they're like different technology standards that are up building these identity aspects and components. So uh, I mentioned like the social sovereign identities or you have some more like on-chain reputation systems using NFTs and SBTs, or you have like- SBTs uh, being so soulbound tokens, right? Yeah, soulbound tokens, which are like non-transferable tokens used as a certificate. So uh, that could be issued based on some activity, provide you even for any actions uh, that you do off chain, on chain, it doesn't matter. But this is something that sticks to your wallet or soul and defines you and is non-transferable. So mm, quite an interesting uh, technology that emerged lately. And uh, yeah, where Marimo comes in is basically from an infrastructure perspective, all these components are built across different ecosystems and then you have like different dApps with within the different chains and the portability aspect right that we mentioned so this is what Rarimo is saying so you you can like make your identity portable from one chain to another it might not feel pain straight away for the user but we always have to make some kind of similarity in the examples, right? With fungible tokens, we've seen this interoperability space uh, primitives. So when people started to like, in the name of liquidity, transferring and exchanging value from one chain mm. yeah. to another, and it took off. It really took off in two plus two years. And we, we besides the like risks and scrutiny around the hacks and Besides that, bridges being one of the uh, most risky places to store your money, the industry is still growing. That means that like interoperability from a fungible token perspective is a valuable thing. All the technical aspects and risk could, will be sold over time and standardized, right? With the DEXs at a certain point, right? So we had so many hacks around DEXs and then the new standards emerged and now, now, now it's a safe place to be yeah. even sometimes uh, compared to the centralized exchanges and yeah. the recent uh, recent stories. With the interoperability of identity and reputation, I think the problem is going to be like 10 times more painful because you, we need to understand that with fungible tokens, you just like exchange the value. So there is no like, heritage or history required behind the token that you need yeah. to transfer. But with reputation, it's super hard to replicate the things and the leverage and like yourself that you've built within even like one single game or metaverse and have like enough time to replicate some aspects of your identity in another application or an ecosystem so our identities one will be like 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 you said it will be different components of different identities but for me but for a user it will be that we like restrain from time we dedicate to our digital stuff. So portability of those identity pieces and interoperability. I, I, I'm I'm betting that it will be a ten times more problem that we have in interoperability around fungible tokens, and that's what Rarimo solves, and that's but that, that, that's the future we're building towards. So if I was, and, if, I, if I was gonna if I was gonna summarize it, your your you're betting, your view is that identity within, and identity as defined as broadly as what we were at the start at the start of this, as in all of the places that you build reputation, spend time and interact will create digital representations that you want to be able to move between applications within ecosystems. So I... Um, built a reputation in Aave DAO, and I want that reputation to. I want to if I go and log into Compound DAO or Make a DAO, yeah. I want people to know. I want to be able to bring that reputation with me, which requires some set of identity primitives that that yeah. ecosystem supports. But then you're saying, well, actually, the world is going to be multi-chain. We're going to live in this in this place in which you, yeah. you you will expect we will expect users at least for some time to move between different ecosystems as well. And okay. if I've built up my reputation 
in in Uniswap DAO, I should be able to go across to Avalanche and bring that reputation into the Pangolin DAO. And so there needs to be some concept of identity being portable between ecosystems, between layer one protocols as well. And you're saying this is a harder issue because of the nature in which identity evolves over time. It's not just a token. It's yeah. a token with history associated with it that as I interact with those dApps, I build that history up. And so yeah. being able to bring those across the multiple ecosystems is actually quite a difficult problem to solve. Yes, and what I would exactly and what I would add uh, in that aspect. So there are certain standards and the identity pieces that exist off chain. And you need to be able to bring those things on chain, the proofs of their existence around you on chain and being able to deliver this proof to different applications. It could be like certificates of, I don't know, the you graduating a university or doing a course somewhere. And these are like all the interaction activities that you do off chain. And it could be, it could be like something recorded or proofed on chain. So you, you're just going to be uh, using something like Rarimo to put that information on chain and make it provable and uh, across of any dApp. Uh, uh, in any chain. So let's let's go down a level um, from the point of view of a developer um, or so, a, a, an application builder. When when should I think about integrating Raremo? What is Raremo's tools giving to me as an application builder that makes my life easier? From an easiness perspective, what I would mention is that so. Very business type of problem. So today, if you were willing to integrate identity providers that are doing self-sovereign identity standard, and let me just clarify what that is. So that means that you have an, for example, identity credential issuer that issues, for example, your location. But this information is not stored like on chain or in any database. This is issued as a credential and stored exclusively within the user wallet. So if you lose access to that credential wallet, the information is gone. Uh, what What is the kind of use case? So if you're a DAP now in any chain and you want to integrate or allow this type of self-sovereign identity standard and credentials to be allowed as an access point or like verification standard within the DAP, Today, because those solutions don't exist on chain, so they don't publish the states of the credentials on chain and they can't prove the validity directly. So each DAP builder has to go and integrate, do the integration one by one. So I have to find these different uh, uh, service providers. I need to integrate through API WebSocket. This is like the one by one. It's a, it's a huge challenge, especially if you're just getting started, you don't have enough resources, you can't support the solution, especially if you're building on a smart contract level, you know, and imagine you need some kind of additional layer of API integration for the state updates and like making sure that the proofs are valid and it's craziness, especially in the Web3 real, we need all the interactions approvable in a cryptographic manner and easily readable on chain. And that's what Rarimo comes in. So you basically integrate Rarimo with, within like whatever chain you're on and authorizing smart contract to read out the state credentials, uh, validity from any provider that is connected to the Rarimo. So it's like an, from business point of perspective, it becomes like an aggregator of different identity and like this social components uh, that exist across in different forms. And you, with one integration, can have full control and uh, manage this entire interaction via on-chain, via smart contracts. And, and of and course, what... with the full privacy, because we're using the zero knowledge rules in terms of like delivering the credential existence or any type of identity piece. And, and what um, identity providers are you guys integrated with so far? So we're... 
we're in the testing phase and I can't disclose the names, but uh, from the partnership perspective, we decided to, uh, we decided to do our launch with one of the biggest names within the space. And what I can mention at this capacity is that we focused on pretty unique identi identifiers and so-called like credentials that are, they could be native to only digital existence, mm. such as like proof of being a human, right? Mm. So, and it, it's pretty unique. And that's what, what fascinates me within the space is that, so we have now this new way and new identifier credentials popping up within exclusively that will belong to only metaverses and metaverse and the web three space. And this is, this, this will be something exclusively for the interactions within the space. So in a physical world, you don't have right. I mean, the, the only reason I'm asking is from a developer point of view, obviously, if I want to integrate this, then I want to know that there are identity providers that will come yeah, yeah. with this protocol otherwise. Yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, so it, the, when when uh, when there's going to be a better mainnet available, so there's yep. going to be 10 largest uh, identity providers already connected and uh, having an end-to-end -end, uh, demo use case is deployed. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, yeah, and this is, this is actually like something I always find valuable. So besides like building the infrastructure and within the web space, I think like end-to-end -end flow and demonstration of how things could be tangibly improve the certain experiences for the end users is something that's missing within the web space, web three space. And this is something I personally emphasize always to uh, partner and demo for every use case. So um, it's been, it's been really wonderful having you on the show. Where, where would be the best place for people to sort of get involved? And when, when do you expect this to go live so that people can uh, uh, use it in anger rather than just on testnet? Uh, so from, so there's going to be ability for the developers to start building on top of Rarimos. This will become available by end of the summer, mm -hmm. but before that, there's going to be pretty large partnerships across the ecosystems where the end user experiences will be enabled in terms of like replicating your identity from one chain to another or delivering the ZK proofs of your humanhood from one for one application for a certain flow. So it's going to be very tangible. And besides that, we do agree that like identity space and the standardization is something that's going to require time uh, up building. So we'll definitely deliver a very tangible and user centric demos. That. Okay, and the and the best place to get started? It's to go on the website, rarimo.com, and explore the documentation that is available. So R-A-R-I-M-O.com. I will put the link in the show notes. Lasha, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Peter. You better call on these guys. I'm going radical, I'm going radical, I'm going radical, I'm going radical. I have a speed D5, never on a decline. Building the future, I feel like a savage.